let's uh, bow for a word of prayer as the children are going to their, their class. Let's, uh, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this blessing of being together and being able to rejoice in who you are and your name and what you have done for us. And uh, we're grateful for the children who are going to their class. We're thankful for that blessing and that gift that we have in them. May they experience uh, your joy and your freedom as they hear your word today and as they, uh, as they respond to that. And may we too hear your word today. May we be willing to surrender and submit to your direction and your commands so that we might see you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a kid, my parents took me to uh, Kennedy Space Center, and uh, I was absolutely fascinated by looking at the Apollo rockets, where these huge mammoth rockets, you can see a picture there of just uh, one part of it, and uh, the man that is standing at the bottom. And, and these rockets are absolutely mammoth. How many have been to the Space Kennedy Center? Anybody? Yeah, lots of you have, and so you've seen that. And even the equipment that brought those rockets to the launch pad, and, and it just was, I was just mesmerized by that, realizing that, that we had the capability of launching this huge rocket, breaking through the gravitational pull of Earth and finally making it into, into space and onto the moon and so on. And uh, a couple of years before I was born, uh, President Kennedy had announced this audacious goal of sending men to the moon uh, by the end of the, the 1960s. It was a, a big dream. It was a very difficult task, a very dangerous task, actually, to make it to, to the moon, this mission that they had in mind. Uh, one example of this dangerous mission part is uh, in 1967, uh, there was a crew of astronauts that were in the launch pad. Uh, they were or in, the, in the capsule in the launch pad. They were having some tests in the anticipation they were going to be the first human beings in orbit around the Earth. And as they were going through all the tests, there was actually a, a chemical reaction that happened in one of the wiring. And they had, I think, 30 miles worth of wiring and there was a, one of the pieces of the wire was missing its insulation and there was a reaction with the chemicals and it actually started on fire and because the uh, capsule was actually full of 100% oxygen, it just erupted very quickly and, and uh, Roger Chafee, one of the uh, astronauts, was heard to say there's a fire in the, in the cockpit there and, and within seconds they had all had died. And uh, two and a half years later, we had Apollo 11. And uh, once again, the astronauts were, uh, were in this uh, launching uh, capsule, ready to get to the moon. There was a speech that was written for President Nixon at the time called, In the Event of a Moon Disaster. And this speech was to be given by President Nixon if anything went wrong and the astronauts were in trouble. They were, to, uh, they were to cut off all communication to the astronauts and they were going to just allow them to die, right? And this is the, uh, the, 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 the worst case scenario that would, that would happen. But fortunately, they did not have to do that. That's not what happened. But rather on July 20th, 1969, with less than 30 seconds of fuel left in the uh, in the lunar capsule, lunar module that touched down on the Sea of Tranquility in, uh, on the moon. Uh, Commander Neil Anderson, or Neil, Neil Anderson, there's another guy that I know, Neil Armstrong, uh, who uh, stepped down on the ladder. You know his famous words, right? One, let's say it together. One small step for a man one giant leap for mankind. And so this has made history, right? And so most of us are aware of that. And there was a great deal of celebration a few days later when they all made it safely back to Earth. They had victory parades in Chicago and New York and L.A. Uh, they attended dinner with members of Congress and governors. And President Nixon gave the astronauts a Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, so this is an amazing celebration, uh, a huge success for the human race that we're able to uh, launch out of our, our celestial body that we all live on and find ourselves on another uh, uh, celestial body in space. And a very significant and difficult technological achievement by mankind. But 2,000 years ago, 
There was a much more significant, much more difficult journey that took place here on this planet. And we're reminded of that as our text that we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 1 today. And Luke is the one who is writing this. Uh, Dr. Luke is the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke, and this is his second book, which we call Acts, so the Acts of the Apostles. And this is how he starts it off. He says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about that that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up in heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them, gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them, uh, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then, jumping down to verse 9, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And so here we have mission accomplished. We have Jesus, the Son of God, descending from heaven into the earth, and there he accomplished what he set out to do, that he suffered and he died and he rose again. He revealed himself as the risen Savior to the disciples and his, what he came to do to redeem mankind through his love, through his sacrifice on the cross, was now accomplished. And now he ascended back into heaven where there was a great celebration that broke out. The prophet Daniel actually received a glimpse of this moment. This is in Daniel 7. It says this, As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient One and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that the people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal it will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. So this is a powerful description of this moment when Jesus finished his mission here on this earth and then ascended back to heaven with his mission be accomplished. This Thursday, by the way, is Ascension Day. In the calendar that we have, the church calendar, this is the day that we recognize 40 days after Easter Sunday is Ascension Day, the day that Jesus rose back, the triumphant uh, Jesus who was enthroned at the right hand of the Father, who was given all authority and power uh, over the world, and his mission was celebrated because it was successful. And so this is what is launching our new sermon series called Sent Out. We're going to be looking at the, or the uh, Acts of the Apostles. We're going to be looking at this over the next several weeks. Uh, this is why the missions team is starting to do their, their five-week series on what they have experienced in Germany and what does this mean for us as a church. Uh, and we're going to be continuing to learn what it means to be sent out. God is a sending God. God sent his son uh, to come to this earth. Jesus sent his Holy Spirit who then sends us into this world to accomplish the work that he has called us to do. And so we want to talk about this over the next several weeks. But today we're going to be focusing on chapter 1 where Jesus' mission was accomplished here in the earth and then he ascended into heaven. And so what are the benefits of a, a finished mission? Like there is always something that is accomplished. When you have a mission that is accomplished, that is uh, completed, what are the benefits? So we're going to be talking about the benefits of Jesus' ascension and his completed mission. The first one that I want to talk about is this, and that is that we now have power over sin and death and the devil. When you think about the mission of Jesus Christ that there really is not a whole lot of hope for us unless Jesus finished the work that he did here in this earth. We would not be able to overcome temptation. Uh, even if you are a person of extreme 
self-will, somebody who has unusual willpower, somebody who is very disciplined, there will always be a time when you will experience the, uh, the, the moment from which you are unable to resist temptation. But Jesus showed us that it is possible. Jesus was tempted in every way and yet was without sin. This is exactly what it says in Hebrews 4 verse 15, that Jesus was tempted in every way just as we are and yet he did not sin. So you think of all the things that he experienced and, and he, was, he was hated and reviled and yet he did not retaliate. He did not exercise revenge. In fact, it says that he exercised love for his enemies. And so Jesus was tempted in every way, and yet he was able to overcome sin. He accomplished the mission that he came to set out to do, and that is to defeat the power of sin. And it is that power that now resides in us. His power gives us the ability to overcome sin. We share Christ's power. That is the new reality that we have because of Christ's successful mission here on this earth. What about death? How do you view death? And for some of us, it's very frightening for us. We don't like to talk about death. We don't like to, we like to, we want to live forever. We don't want to uh, experience all of that. And we tend to avoid talking about it. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And so when Jesus rose from the dead, he defeated the power of death in once and for all. His mission was accomplished. We no longer need to fear death. Death is no longer a period at the end of a sentence. It now is a comma. We just make that transition uh, into relationship with him. What about the devil? Have you ever experienced um, a palpable presence of evil? Have you ever experienced that? I mean, I, I've experienced uh, what I believe to be somebody who was possessed by an evil spirit and it was a very, uh, you know, a difficult situation. And Jesus says we do not le need to live in fear of that any longer because Jesus stared down evil. Jesus took on the enemy and easily defeated him by dying on the cross and rising again through his resurrection. Jesus ascended in triumph because he accomplished his mission over the enemy. And that same power that he has over the enemy, we now share with him. 1 John 4.4 4 says that greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. And so we now have power because of Christ living in us to defeat the enemy. So that's one of the major big pieces that Wes was referring to earlier, that we now have power over sin and death and the enemy. The second benefit that we have from the ascended Christ is the fact that we have access to Jesus anytime, anywhere. When Jesus came to this earth, he was a human being. And he was painfully limited to the same things that we are limited to, our space and time. We can only be in one place at one time. When he was born, he was born as a baby, totally dependent upon a peasant couple that was able to look after him and nurture him and, and bring him up and so on. But Jesus was a vulnerable human being, incapable of being at more than one place at one time. And so if you were sick and living in Jerusalem and you were in bed and you needed to have attention, you wanted God to come and help you or Jesus to come and help you, you had to wait for Jesus to physically come and to be there with you. But 40 days after his resurrection, there was a dramatic shift. When Jesus ascended into heaven, there was this major change. This is what it says again in verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their, from their sight. Verse 10, they were looking intently up into that sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. And so the, the disciples were there. They were watching this ascension, and it was a very uh, uh, unusual uh, observation, of course, for them to see this. And at first, it didn't seem like it was a positive thing. It didn't seem like a good thing at all. I mean, Jesus is leaving them. 
Uh, what good can come from that? Jesus is being taken away from them. So what benefit can there possibly be as uh, Jesus leaves? And so the disciples and we, are, we, we learn, we understand that, that now that Jesus has left this, this world as a human being and he is now in the presence of God and he is in the heavenly realms, that he has entered into a completely different realm. He is no longer constrained by the space-time dimension that we all are constrained by. And now he is in the heavenly realms in a new dimension. He is far beyond the dimension that we are restricted by. And uh, he is available. He is available anytime, anywhere. And, and this is a, a, a privilege that we have. No matter where we go, Christ's presence is available to us. His power is available. There is no time that you will call upon him that he is not able to respond. So when you think about our technology, we like to have technology that gives us connection at all times, right? We, we value that. We have our smartphones. We have our internet connection. We, we look for that. And uh, we, we uh, you know, when the network goes down here at the church, we all get upset because, oh, there it goes again. And uh, so I'm sure you've had experiences when you've traveled and you've had your cell phone. There's no signal because maybe you're in a remote area or there just isn't a signal where you are. And every cell company is bragging about how great their coverage is, but you know that that's simply not the reality. But Jesus has perfect reception every time. No matter where you are, whether you're in Kitchener here, whether you're in Germany like the missions team was, or, or in an African country, or, or in Iceland, or some remote part of Ontario, or wherever it is, you have perfect reception with Jesus at every single time. There's no place that you can go where you do not have access to Jesus. So whether you're in your emergency room, or whether you are in an airplane, or whether you are uh, up all night sick uh, with a sick child, there is no time, no place, nowhere where you do not have access to Christ's presence and his power in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is where we go, hey, you know, he's our rescuer. Hey. Um, and we have this beautiful picture of Jesus being available at all moments. And even if you forget to, to pray to God, even if you forget you're in this, in this uh, space where you're just not simply thinking about it or you're just overwhelmed or you're feeling depressed or whatever it may be, did you know that Jesus actually intercedes for you? Jesus praying for you? And this is what the beautiful thing is, that, that Jesus, you may think about, well, what is Jesus doing in heaven? He'd done all this, this amazing work that he came to do on this earth, and he, and he died and he rose again, and maybe he's just resting and relaxing in heaven because, well, that was a big job, and so maybe he should just rest and do nothing. Well, that's simply not true. And, and Jesus is continuing to intercede on our behalf. This is what it says in Hebrews 7, 24. Because Jesus lives forever, he has become a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Now listen to that. He always lives to intercede for them. And 1 John 2 verse 1, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So we have a, a whole understanding of Jesus being our advocate, somebody who is interceding on our behalf, who is constantly aware, who is, it says, always lives to intercede. And so I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you know, you're just finding a, a very difficult uh, set of circumstances and you think to yourself, boy, wouldn't it be great if somebody was praying for me? Wouldn't it be great if somebody knew what I was going through and, and that they would pray for me because I'm going through a really difficult time? Well, you do. You actually do. You have Jesus who knows what you are facing and he is interceding for you. Whatever your need is, Jesus is praying for you. So when you remember that Jesus, when he was living on this earth, Jesus went through and experienced all of the temptations that you and I experience. Jesus experienced all of the, the challenges, all of the horrible things that, that we might face. He was tempted in every way. In the Garden of Gethsemane, it says that he, he sweat drops of blood for us. He was spat upon. He was tempted. He was rejected. He was tortured. 
And so all of the horrible things that, that you and I might go through here in this planet, Jesus has already gone through it. And he knows exactly what you are facing. And, and I, you may have this experience when, when you've had some kind of tragedy or some kind of experience in your life and it's very difficult. And, and what do you do? It's very natural for us to go and seek somebody who has gone through something similar, right? And sometimes you think to yourself, no one knows what I'm going through. No one can really truly know how painful and difficult it is that I'm, what I'm going through. And so we go to somebody who has gone through it and we experience this there's this freedom that comes from it. There's this, this relief, this comfort and encouragement. When we go to somebody that has gone through the same thing, they, they know what you're saying. They understand why you're, why you're feeling those things because they themselves have gone through it. And this is exactly what we have in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself has gone through what you have gone through. He knows exactly what you are facing. And there's big relief and there's big encouragement for us to know that Jesus knows you, he knows what you're facing, and he's interceding for you, he's praying for you. There's nowhere that you can go where Jesus' presence and power is not available to us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Susan? Hallelujah. Amen. Lord. I can count on you, Susan. Now the third benefit of Jesus' ascension is that we have been given a purpose. So just before he was ascended, this is what Jesus said. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is a verse to be reckoned with. This is a verse that we need to really dig into and understand. These are the final moments before Jesus ascends into heaven the final moments that he has with the disciples, the final words that he is saying to them, this is what I want to stay with you. This is what I want you to have stuck in your memory. This is the most important thing. This is the purpose that I'm giving you. I want you to understand this, disciples. And he wants us to understand the same thing. Jesus has accomplished his mission, and now he has sent us out to do our mission. This is the Great Commission, is what we often call it, to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. To be witnesses not only here at home, not only to be in our neighborhood or at our workplace or at our school. Uh, we are to do it, uh, be witnesses wherever we travel, cross-culturally, and to the ends of the earth. This is the purpose of and the mission of the church. This is why we are here. The church is gathered right now on a Sunday morning and then it scatters for the rest of the week. This is our purpose, to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, wherever we are, to testify to the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done. Make no mistake about it. This is the purpose for all Christians. This is not just for the super spiritual. This is not just for those who are paid staff, those who are pastors, those who are evangelists, those who are directors of parachurch organizations. This is for all believers. This is for all disciples of Jesus Christ. What is a disciple? What is a disciple of Jesus? A disciple is somebody who follows him. Somebody who is not just somebody content in just believing in him and then just sitting back waiting for his return. A disciple is actually somebody who is willing to follow him, to obey him, to respond to him, to show love to him. And so a disciple, by definition, is not somebody who's going to be just sitting by and doing nothing. A disciple, by definition, is discipling others. That's really what a disciple is doing. A disciple, a follower of Jesus, is actually testifying to the good news of who Jesus is to those around them. And so if you're not uh, involved in that, maybe we need to understand more and more of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. 
Now, I know we have all kinds of, uh, sometimes this can bring some anxiety to people. I know that whenever we talk about being witnesses to others. Sometimes we have this vision of standing on a street corner and starting to talk out loud to strangers about who Jesus is. That can kind of be a frightening experience for most of us. Uh, Maybe we feel like we are uh, just uh, not equipped. We don't have the gifting. Nobody has enabled us to know how to do this. And we, uh, or maybe it's, it's difficult for us to share because it's, it's a personal thing. Or maybe it's not personal enough, right? If you think about it, if you're not excited about your relationship with Jesus, why would you go about sharing that, that with other people? And so there's lots of barriers that can happen, sometimes based upon misunderstanding or sometimes based upon fear, sometimes based on, on disobedience. Uh, but we have all these obstacles of what it means to be a testimony, to be a, a witness before others about who Jesus is. But I want you to know something. And I want you to hear this very carefully. Whatever Jesus says and whatever he does is always out of love. It's always out of love. So whatever he commands us to do, whatever he expects us to do, whatever he wants us to do, whatever he's asked us to invite, he's invited us into, it's always based out of love. It's always based upon what he knows is best for his kingdom and what's best for us. And so he knows that as we follow, and when our, when our mission aligns with his mission, he knows that we will experience the greatest amount of joy and freedom and peace uh, when we align with who Jesus is. And so God has invited us into, this is one of the benefits of his ascension. We've been invited into this mission. He's given us a purpose. This is why we exist here in this earth. That's why we're not zipped unto heaven as soon as we become believers in Christ. He's allowed us to stay here so that we would be his witnesses here on this earth. And so we can rejoice in that. God has given us a purpose for which we can experience great joy. So as a result of the ascension, we can have this lasting confidence that we have power over sin and death and the devil. Because of the ascension, you and I now have access to the immediacy, the power, and the prayers of Jesus Christ anytime, anywhere. And because of the ascension, we have been given a purpose that will give us the greatest and deepest joy and gladness to our soul. And for that, we can give him worship to the risen and ascended Christ who knows us and loves us, and we praise his name for that. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you have ascended, that you accomplished your mission, and that you are now seated at the right hand of the Father. You are continuing to to display your power and your presence and your might in our lives and that you are giving us all that we need to demonstrate uh, what it means to be your followers, to be your witnesses uh, for uh, the place and the location that you have given to us, the people that we are surrounded with, our circles of influence that are before us. And God, we ask for your uh, continued uh, encouragement as we learn to grow in our understanding of what it means to be your follower in this way. We thank you that you have given us everything that we need. And so we praise your name and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.